right. Max, thank you for coming to Slush. Thank you for having me. Let's start with a, a fun question. This is your first trip to Finland. Correct. But you have a real love for Finnish rock music, believe it or not. <laughs> he knows the history of Finnish rock music, and he really does. How did that happen? I'll try to keep it short. So when I moved to the United States, I grew up in Ukraine, moved to the US in 91. I was a typical Eastern European engineer who thought that writing code in assembly language was the pinnacle of manly expression because everybody else needed high level languages and I could just go directly to the hardware. And I was the only person like that I knew in Chicago, except there was this whole BBS scene before the web where I randomly ran into what became known as the demo scene, which was perhaps randomly centered in Finland. And so as I learned more and more about these people worldwide that were crazy assembly language hackers pushing hardware to its limits, building these amazing demos, competing, I became more and more obsessed with this magical place called Finland where they got together once a year at Assembly, the big conference, and uh, showed off their, their software to each other. And kind of started absorbing the culture and getting into it. And you never came, but you absorbed the, the rock music part of the culture. And I think what's interesting, I've heard about the demo scene before, and I mean, people always think of like Nokia being the kind of core of Finnish technology, but the demo scene predated Nokia in many ways. <laughs> um, let's talk about PayPal a bit. So, you know, I want to talk about for all the founders and soon-to-be founders out there, I want to hear about the earliest days of PayPal. You were, you told me before, employee zero, which I think is interesting. Um, what, what was that like? You know, what, what do you remember most about those days? Oh, I, as, as a co-founder and an engineer, I have to start from zero, as, as, as software people do. Um, back to the demo scene for a second, I randomly met this guy, Peter Thiel, at a lecture at Stanford. I pitched him on an idea that was extremely different from what PayPal is today, or was even 20 years ago. But he was crazy enough to say, I'll invest in your company. And in the back of my mind, I thought, I have no idea what to do with that. I want to be the CTO. I'm going to recruit you as a CEO. I said, OK, that's, that worked out. But you have to go recruit a technical team. And so I basically looked at the smartest engineers I knew in my head, and they were all demo sceners. And so I recruited a bunch of people from my demo scene friendships from high school and college. And um, we, for about a year, we were just heads down writing code. And, Majority of that code got thrown away because the first product didn't work, and the second product didn't work, and the third product didn't work, as it always happens in startups. And you know, if, I, I know as a founder myself, I always think about like the incredible roller coaster of being a, a founder. And I, I actually, I remember seeing pictures of the early days. You were like sleeping under the desk or something at PayPal, and I, oh, yeah. and, and I just did. You, were you? How aware were you of like, the, the, the risks of being an SDR, the ups and downs? Or how, and how, how like, stressed were you about what the, the direction? Or were you more just like, just get me the, let me code and let me just get my little thing? I, I think I benefited tremendously from the fact that PayPal was, I think, startup number five, and the previous four failed. So I was very accustomed to working very hard, failing, picking up the pieces, doing it again. So I, I was not scared of failure. I was actually very worried that if this fails, like, I, I was reluctant to recruit a team because my previous startups, it was just me and a co-founder or me and a co-founder and one other engineer. And so I knew how to handle the tough conversation, guys, we failed, we have to shut down. But within a couple of months, we had like 15 people and then 30 people and Peter insisted we hire more people. And like, Peter, if this fails, we will have to own the failure in front of 30 people, 100 people, like that's terrifying. So I was very worried that once it fails, which it always had before, I would have to eat the bitter bread in front of a lot of people. Wow, okay. Um, and I think all of you from that group, Peter, Elon, Reed, Jeremy, you're still all very close, but I want to tell everyone, don't call it a mafia. He doesn't, they don't like the mafia term. It's, it's more of a squad or a crew. I and mean, what do you prefer here? <laughs> I haven't thought of an alternative okay. <laughs> group, group noun, but Mafia suggested we got together to do something nefarious, and we were young and idealistic and wanted to change the world. Got it. Um, I want to talk about Slide, one of your companies that you founded that doesn't get that much play. People don't talk about it very much. Um, you, know, you, told, you started four companies before PayPal, then you started Slide, I think, right after PayPal. Yep. Um, tell us, you know, I think on paper it was a success, but tell us a little bit what was Slide and a little bit about, like, you told me it wasn't very satisfying there, so tell me a little bit about that story. Slide basically 
So right after PayPal ended, I wanted to step back and develop a framework for what will happen. So the internet boom was booming. And I wanted to have a framework for what next company I might start. So I sat down and wrote this big thesis around the internet is becoming social. Social interactions are fundamentally sin driven. So I wrote down seven deadly sins and that I'm going to start a company or fund a company for every sin. The most important sin is vanity because it's the one that everyone has no matter how much they try to avoid it. So I should find an idea that is all about vanity. And that led to Slide, which was basically a photo sharing slash media sharing company. And I maintained that the logic was perfectly sound, except the, I told myself a story that that's what I really was trying to do. What I was really trying to do is say, I'll do anything except for payments, because my one success, the, up, to the, up to PayPal, everything failed. And then I finally got one success under my belt. And I was the payments kid. And then I was a payments guy. And then I was a not so young payments man. And then I really wanted to be not a payments guy. So I was like, I'll do whatever, and here's a story. And so we built this media sharing company, and it did fine. Google acquired it for quite a lot of money, and uh, everybody did financially great. But all throughout the process, I kept on looking in the mirror and saying, OK, I'm not a payments guy now, but I'm not a happy non-payments guy. And uh, ultimately, if you don't have the love for what you do, it's very hard to be satisfied by what you're doing. And I told you uh, earlier that. When you started that, um, I was, I think I was, I was, I had it around a media company that was also at Viacom during it, the period. And I kept thinking, because I kind of knew you, I'm like, he's not a media guy. What, what, is he, what is he doing starting this media business? And it was one of those like, things, but then you sold it for a bunch of money and I was really jealous. I was like, how did he do that? Um, and but I also look at today, I look at Elon uh, and Twitter. And Elon has done great with lots of hardware things, but he's not a media guy either, and Twitter's a media business. So you don't have to comment on that. But I, but I definitely, like, I saw this parallel between, like, you know, is, is this really in his heart? Like, it wasn't really in your heart either at that point. Yeah, all these PayPal guys trying to uh, get into media, maybe, maybe a theme there. It might be a little bit of a theme, yes. <laughs> um, let's talk about a firm. You're, you're 12 years in on this one. Um, but how did you start this company and, and why? So now you're like, okay, you tried the media thing, didn't work. You're like, okay, I guess I'm a, I am a payments guy. So in, in many ways, so I, I had this extremely helpful conversation with my wife who knows me from the very first year of PayPal, who had set me down and said, you're not a media guy, get over it. And two, all of that contortionism around not being a payments guy, you are a payments guy. You love this stuff. Every time you hear somebody talk about a payment startup, you get so into it. Like It's time for you to go back to your roots and find out if there's something to do in payments. And I was like, yeah, but it's been there, done that. And now there's Stripe and all these companies and all these amazing things. Like, What will I find? And I happened to have lunch with a person who happened to be my chief risk officer at PayPal. 20 years before, who proceeded to co-found Palantir, a very, very successful guy, Nathan. And just randomly, I said, you know, the interesting thing, we had all this information at PayPal, all these payments, data points. We never tried to do credit. And it's such an ancient industry, and yet it's still underwritten and processed and done the same way it was done in the 70s with credit cards. And the fundamental kind of decision making is rooted in like the 1600s. No one's ever really tried to poke at it very hard to see what happens. And we stare at each other for five minutes, kind of going like, you're right. There hasn't been a lot of innovation in that. And so I went home and said, like, it, it can be true. It, there, there has to have been something. And there were a lot of attempts. But by then, the bug got me. And I was like, well, yeah, maybe it won't be the only one. Maybe there'll be other people doing it. But like, I, I'm so excited to dig into something that I care about. Like, I, I don't care if there's a million other people doing it. I'll, I have to do it myself. So Nathan eventually co-founded a firm with me, and we found some other people. And, and, and wasn't there like a kind of a, a fairness thing about it, too? You were thinking like the problem is that the credit is, industry was just inherently unfair to people. So yeah. I'd like to hear more about that. Exactly. So the other thing that happened, so I'm an immigrant in the US. And once you're successful, you kind of tend to push bad memories of your early days as an immigrant out of your memory. The more I thought about credit, the more I came back to this one story where in college, one of my companies failed, as they all did then. And I just could not pay my credit card bills. I, I had zero money, and I was too proud to ask my parents for help. And they were very poor immigrants, too. And so I just didn't pay my bills for three months. And I got nasty calls, and it was very embarrassing. And my roommates would be like, oh, you have a collector on the phone. You got to pick it up. And like, oh. So fast forward 10 years, I had 
long been okay financially. I had a well-paying job being a chief, chief technology officer at PayPal. We just took the company public. I went to a car dealership to buy a new car, which was my very first new car. And the guy checked my credit rating and said, your credit is so bad, the only way you'll get a car today is if you pay cash for it. Like, you cannot get a car loan, your credit is ruined. <laughs> what kind of car was it? I wanted to buy a convertible, because I was in, living in California, so okay. I, I wanted a, a, a small convertible to take my girlfriend, now wife, driving around, along the coast. And she was right there with me, and I, I was turning purple with embarrassment. And so this visceral feeling of, I have a great job and my financial stability is assured. I am a newly minted, independently wealthy person, and yet my score is dragging behind me like an ankle weight that I can never get rid of. And it took another multiple years to recover my, my credit score. And so that was like the one sort of visceral memory, like why, is it, why does it take so long to fix the mistakes of your past? And two, as you look at credit offerings, just overall, not, not just for people who have had a mistake in the past, even people with perfect credit scores, inevitably the deal between you and the lender is always a bet where you're betting on yourself and the lender is betting on you screwing up. Where if you're late, they have late fees so they can make more money. If you didn't make the minimum payment on time, there's typically some kind of a penalty that kicks in that makes it even more expensive. All the conditions are in very, very small print on the back of the statement so you don't read it because that describes exactly how much money you're going to pay more than you expected. So the more I looked at it, the more I thought the real opportunity here isn't to build a better credit score, it's to build a credit score and a credit product that actually aligns the interest of the lender and the borrower, where if the lender makes money, it's because the borrower is doing fine. If the borrower is doing well, the lender makes everything. And if the, the, the borrower is stumbling because something bad happened to them, they lost their job, they, they can't figure it out, the lender is not motivated to try to rip them off or to, to make a little bit of extra money. And so we built the entire company ethos and every product around this idea that you want to be fully transparent, you want to be completely fair, and most importantly, you want to make sure that if your borrower is doing well, then you're doing well. And if they're not, you, you don't get to benefit from it. Interesting. So do you still think the credit score needs to be fixed? Yes, I'm, I am confident that the credit score needs to be fixed. Got it. <laughs> um, so how long have you been public now? How many years? Uh, we will be two years on in the very beginning of next year. So how do you feel about being public? I mean, especially, you know, the, your industry, sorry to say, has gotten a little bit of a bad rap because Klarna's valuation did this massive drop and everyone talked about it. It was earlier this year. And, uh, you know, there, there's someone in the same industry. So, but you're public and so we see your, your stock price, you see it visibly. It's not just one valuation that comes out. Um, so how do you feel about that? It's good training for... Uh, for, for uh, turbulent flying, if, if you're worried about that, you, you, get, uh, you get excellent uh, preparedness by waking up every morning and going, today my stock will either go up or it will go down, and I have no control and no predictability of what will happen. I think as a private company, you really benefit from this idea that whatever happens out there in the public markets, you know, it, it's all kind of irrelevant. Like you raise your money, your head's down, you're building a product, it's going to be okay. One day you have to raise money again, and then you get revalued. And when that happens, if the last time you raised money was a huge bull market and you couldn't get you know, backers to, 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 to walk away from you because everybody wants to push money into your hands, then the market turns down, which is what's happening now, you get this punch in the face with like, actually your valuation is not at all what it was like. So the drop is catastrophic and painful, and you have to explain to your employees and you kind of have to tell them that when they exercise their stock options now, the actual value of the share is way below what they paid for it. And in the US, in some circumstances, it's still a huge tax bill. And so it could be very, very difficult as a private company. As a public company, you get revalued every day, every second, like every trade, somebody decides to sell your share at a price. And you get used to it. And so it's a little bit easier to tolerate the daily fluctuations. And the best you can do is remind yourself that it's a voting machine every day and you wish it were a weighing machine that sort of decides, you think it's like passing a test or getting a, a grade on a test, but you're not being tested right now. You're, you're only being tested in a decade schedule and you just have to keep that very clear in your head. And the grade only matters in the final, all the, all the other tests get thrown out. 
So was it a good decision to go public? It was in the sense that you have significant liquidity available to you, even in the worst possible time in the market, which today you could argue one of the worst times in, in recent history. If a firm needed more capital, we could sell more shares, and that's fundamentally reassuring, I think, to, to employees and shareholders. But at today's price, I'm not sure I would be interested in selling shares. Fortunately, we did very well in our IPO, so our cash position is significantly better than any of our competitors. And I don't think you can do that quite easily, quite as easily if you're a private company. So a lot of public company CEOs talk about how they get pulled into things that are all these requirements for the job, which are pull them away from what they really love about the job. How do, you, how do you manage the kind of responsibilities of being a public company CEO compared to some of the passionate things you want to work on? That's definitely very true and very hard. And the thing that I promised myself is I will just not care about the quarterly earnings and just keep my schedule and my head oriented around, here's what will happen if it takes three months, three months, if it takes six months, six, and if I need to think decade out, that, that's what I should be doing. And you sort of believe that, and then the quarterly earnings time comes, and you have to prep, and you have to write your letter, and you have to rehearse your speech. And uh, the only way to do well as a public company CEO, it's kind of the same way to do as a private company CEO. You surround yourself with people that are experts in the area that you need to cover, and there are lots of people. We, we're lucky to have some that are exceptional investor relations people and communications people, and you can outsource a lot of the really heavy lifting to them and carve out the time to do the things right. that you're supposed to be doing, but it, it is not the same thing. It, it's not true that you can maintain exactly the same mental orientation as a public company CEO versus a private one. And so you, you clearly love startups. I mean, you, you're, a, you're a number seven or eight, or I even know, like you've done a lot of them. And so how do you channel that energy and excitement about startups and about you know, starting something new when you're devoted to one company. You're, you, are, you are a firm. So like, what do you, how, do you, how do you channel your energy around, around you know, the entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial side of you? Um, in, in the multiverse, I would have many clones of me starting companies. But unfortunately, even the multiverse theory does not allow for being aware of your clones. And so I, I wouldn't be able to enjoy other Max's uh, delight in starting companies. There's definitely the zero to one stage is like the most exciting, most interesting thing. That said, the impact of the company I have been running for 12 years and the pace of learning is still so good. Like I'm, I'm very, very stable and stationary in my job. The thing that, I, mean, I think you switch from zero to one is inherently short term. You're just trying to survive. You're trying to get there and like, orient yourself once you have a product market fit and you know, whatever, whatever your goals are. I think the worst case scenario as a startup CEO, public or private, you become very, very fixated on the medium term because you've made it, you're okay, you're just trying to make your next quarter, your quarter after that. That's the surefire way to get to the flat part of the S-curve. Like the Vinod Kosla, one of my great investors and Mentors loves to talk about how all you're doing is you're finding the next S-curve. If you're not looking for one right now, you are just on your way to the flat part where everything slows down, where the creativity is no longer relevant, where you're just trying to get the next quarter and then somebody buys you. The thing that, I, that keeps me energized and keeps me going as a CEO of an almost 3,000-person company now, so I spend a fair amount of my time asking the question, what does it look like 10 years from now? Like, yes, we need to make the quarter. You know, the, the stock price will not take care of itself. We've got to keep delivering the numbers. But the five years from now, a firm will not be growing at the current pace. You know, high double, triple digit can only come from the next S-curve. You have to find that zero to one, one to two, high pace product. And you have to invest the effort and be willing to fail. So even within a large company, different skill set, different mode of operation, but you have to find ways to create the next big thing. That substitutes for a lot of that startup excitement that I crave. And I, I definitely carve out a lot of time to, uh, to invest in that. So can you maybe clue us in on what yet uh, a firm you're working on that might have that S-curve? Um, you know, the, the, one of the things about S-curves is you have to believe 
but you also have to be very willing to live with the fact that that's the wrong S curve. It's actually not going to work. So the, the things that we work on inherently have capacity for failure. They're not extension features. They're, they're things that may or may not work. So a firm, from inception, we were a e-commerce focused point of sale lender. So if you're buying a couch, you're buying a Peloton bike, you're buying a t-shirt, we will be there to transparently buy it or pay for it over time. Buy now, pay later is the term of the trade. I don't particularly like the acronym, but that's what people know it to be. And it's basically all online. And at this point, Affirm is 2% of US e-commerce, which is kind of an incredible number. It's a, for a 10-year-old company to account for that, for that much is cool, and also suggests that there's a lot more room to grow. But we've never really figured out a product that works offline. And so about two years ago, I started asking the question, how do you take a firm core values, which is transparency and credit in a way that's accessible and fair and good, without a phone in your hand, without an online checkout, and put it into a user interface that could be used to buy groceries and to go into a physical retail? And the honest answer is it has to be a card, because the credit card or the debit card interface is the best payment interface ever created. I think even touchless pay is still not quite perfect, because your phone sometimes has hiccups, sometimes it's out of battery. There's all these reasons why your phone transaction fails. If you have a card, whether it's touchless or a swipe or a chip, it is the ideal interface for payment. You literally go, and you're done. And so how do you package a firm, which is fundamentally anti-credit card? Like It is literally the anti-credit card product. How do you pack it into a card? And so we built this thing. We call it Debit Plus. It's still very much at its infancy. It I think will be the most important thing that happened because it kind of exists in this blank space between credit cards and debit cards where it allows you to borrow money, but only if you want to. And either before or after the transaction, it's entirely configurable. I have no idea whether it's going to be the biggest thing ever or a footnote in our history. But that, that's what I'm very focused on right well, now. Well, it sounds pretty worthwhile to me. So um, I think it's very cool. Um, the current economy is, is, is what it is. You and I both lived, we, you were at PayPal in 2001, you were doing Slide in 2008. What do, you, what do you think about today? I mean, it's been talked about a lot, but I'm kind of curious from your perspective uh, on it. It's very unique. I think this, is the, this particular downturn is in part caused by geopolitical events that were not the triggers behind 01 and 08. I think we were fortunate to be in peacetime back then. Um, there was no pandemic to, to get rid of. There was no government-created glut of currency. And so I think all these things are unique and different. But then again, every major financial markets upheaval and real economy upheaval was always different. I was very lucky the first two times during 01, we had just raised a very large round of financing. And so we kind of could go into a cave and build product and just not worry too much. During 08, exactly the same thing. I raised money for Slide uh, in a late 07, and we were very well funded and could hide out and just, just work. We're very well funded right now. We have uh, almost $3 billion in cash with a firm. But being public, you get to experience the roller coaster very directly on any given day. Um, but I think the, the only way I know how to cope with extreme downturns and is to just go build great product. And as the, the downturn, every downturn inevitably has a bottom and the recovery. And, the recovery is glorious, but if you're starting your company, you're far better off starting it now than as the recovery begins, because everybody's starting their company when the recovery begins. Right now, only the brave and the crazy are doing it, and so you will have a huge advantage in time of time market, you know, time to market, product market fit, etc. I love that. The, only the brave and crazy will start now, but it's, I think that's absolutely true. Any. Last question, any advice do you have for founders out here? Like, it's a kind of the standard question. Like, what, what would you tell a founder today? Um, lots of things. Uh, the most important thing about starting companies is if you're going to do it at some point in your life, you should do it today. Because as you age, not because of age, but because of other forms of success, it's very hard to give up what you have. You have I, I call it at some point the barnacles of good life. If you have a really nice car and apartment and family and friendships, all of that will be put under pressure. The Friday night that you have to stay up late because the site's down and you got to fix it and your spouse or your friends or your life is knocking on the door and saying, 
come on, we got to go. If you have nothing except for student loans, it's a lot easier to say, well, what, what do I have on the other side of the door? Student loans, those can wait. If you have a, a real interesting, complex life, it, it's that much harder. So do it now if you're ever going to do it. Uh, if you're not ready, join a startup because it's the easiest way to learn. It's someone else's stress, but you're right in the middle of, of the fun. And um, okay. over the years, I learned don't do it alone. Being a solo founder, which I once was, is harder than it appears. Like you get all the control, but none of the emotional support. Got it. All right, be, be brave, crazy, do it now. Okay, there you go. Thank you, Max.